here to present the asking formula. Ask for what you want and get it. Is John Baker, President and CEO of Ready Thinking LLC. Please give him a warm welcome. Hi, my name is John Baker. I'm the creator of the asking formula. And what I do is pretty simple. I teach people how to more effectively ask for what they want regardless of what that is or whom they're talking to or the tone of the conversation. The asking formula allows you to have the most compelling, influential message to get to yes. It also allows you to see where you're sabotaging your efforts, practicing bad asking behaviors that get in the way of your personal and professional brand. The formula, once you learn it, can be applied immediately. One of the best benefits is you can put this into practice right now, today, at your next sales call, your next interaction, your next staff meeting. And you can hold others accountable for good asking behavior, which drives results, gets decisions made the first time. It's a wonderful tool to put into place right now. And oh, by the way, one more thing, you can use it both in your professional life and your personal life because we're holistic human beings and we have lives outside of our work. So when you're looking to get the yes at home, at your place of worship, on your team, the asking formula is a vital tool. Now let me tell you a little bit about where this came from. Part of what you're going to learn is from my experience at American Express where I was chief operating officer. And in that role, my job was to get thousands of employees enthused every day to service their clients. In fact, our mission was to be the world's most respected service brand. And that's a tall order because my competition was pretty good. And they were hustlers. And so to charge the value pricing that we charged and provide the service was ultimately why clients did business with us. Now, when I ran that organization, I had a wonderful team. Great leaders, people who would come in every day committed to doing the best they possibly could. And despite that, I felt my team was poor at asking me for what they needed to succeed. Now think about that. That's troubling because if they couldn't ask me for what they needed, how in the world are they going to someone else across the hall or across the globe and asking them? I gave them their goals after all. I want them to succeed. I want to say yes to what they want and what they're asking for. So if they're ill-equipped to ask me, there's no way they can ask their contemporaries, there's no way they can engage with prospects or clients and drive influence there. So we began using this formula as a means of a leadership competency. How do you lead up? How do you lead across? So your entire team is making solid, good, functional decisions in a collaborative, cohesive way. But in my role there, I also ran a large sales organization. My sales goal every year was about a billion dollars, and I also had about a billion or half a billion dollars in cross sales or uh, inside sales. And similar to my team, my sales group was some of the best in the business. We cherry picked the best talent, but despite that, we were seeing that they were reluctant to ask, like all salespeople, for the close, for the appointment, for a 2% increase in fees. And if you can't ask for that, you're not going to get it. So we began using this as a sales competency. How do you get salespeople to more proactively get to yes and own the sales process as opposed to letting the sales process own them? So part of what you're going to learn is from my experience running that organization. So if you're a leader or if you're a sales professional, you'll find this message should resonate with you. Second source of information that I developed the asking formula through was from my first book. My first book was about change and change management. It was called Ready Thinking Prime for Change. And when I wrote that book, I had the opportunity to go talk to dozens, if not hundreds of people all across the globe, uh, at the C-suite, all the way down to the factory floor, in every industry you can imagine. And I asked each and every one of them what they felt about change. Interestingly, 100% of the people said, we love it. To a person, everybody said, we love change. We think it's the greatest thing in the world. Bring it on. Which is troubling because when you write a book nobody apparently needs. That's not good. And the fact is we know people are challenged by change. So what is going on there? 
What's happening? Are people just delusional? Are they lying to us? If I came into your organization and asked your team about change, my guess is everybody would say, we want it. We want to control it. We want to win. The, ask, or the uh, ready thinking prime for change is about how you actually accomplish that. While everybody says they love change, the fact of the matter is nobody likes being changed. That's where change stops. That's where people dig in their heels. They sit at the end of the bench. Don't call me in, coach. Let's let this policy move on. It'll go through just like the last one did. If we're, if we're, if we're perseverant and we keep our heads low, change won't happen because it feels like somebody's changing me. And by the way, that's the definition of bad leadership and bad salesmanship. Bad leaders, bad salespeople get their audience to feel they're changing them. And once that happens, once you feel somebody's changing you or trying to change you, you stop. You stop changing. You're not a part of the process. So the question becomes, how do you get people to change and embrace change and win in change and have a competitive differentiation because you move through change faster than your competitors? How do you accomplish that without having people feel you're changing them? Now, why this is important to many of you is the fact that sales is pretty simply defined. Sales is asking somebody to change. That's it. Don't get confused with all the other sales descriptions. Sales is asking somebody to change. If I want an appointment with you, I have to ask you to change your calendar. If I, if I want you to purchase this automobile or this service, I have to ask you to change the way you think of me, my products and services, and trust us to do the best job for you. If I want a referral from you, I have to ask you to trust me in a way that's deeper than just simply a transaction. If you can't ask for change, you can't sell. So part of what we're talking about today comes from this method of change. How do you get people to move forward in alignment? Get them to say yes to the things that are important to you and for you to achieve your goals. And the third way I source this material probably resonates with a lot of you is from a very personal example of when I was teaching or helping my son with his ninth grade geometry. Now that was a long time ago for me, granted. Some of you it's probably not that long ago, but I remember ninth grade pretty vividly in my life because quite frankly it wasn't a great year. I grew a lot. Matter of fact, when I started ninth grade I was five foot six. When I ended ninth grade I was six foot six. That's painful. When I started ninth grade, I was 147 pounds, and when I ended ninth grade, I was 147 pounds. So that's painful, and it's not pretty to look at. And you don't fit in. You don't have clothes that fit, and your acne breaks out, and you discover girls for the first time in your life. The whole gumbo. But maybe the challenging thing was ninth grade geometry. My brother Tom was a year older, says, oh, you'll love it. You'll love how you learn to angle the eight ball into the corner pocket or arc the golf ball around the clown's head. But that's not geometry. Remember parallelograms and quadrilaterals, all this stuff. I didn't particularly like it then, and I certainly didn't like it when Jack was asking me for help. And in exasperation, I said, any of this look familiar? Any of this get covered by the teacher today, Jack? He said, oh yeah, but we, she goes so fast. She says, hold your questions to the end, because she might answer something, and um, you don't disrupt her class by asking it too early in the curriculum, and that never helps, right? By the end of the class, you're just that much more confused. And I asked him, why didn't you ask for help? Why didn't somebody raise their hand and ask for the help that you deserve and are entitled to? And his feedback to me was, I didn't know how. And right then I thought, I have not served this boy well because Asking and advocating is a life skill, much more important than ninth grade geometry. Wouldn't you agree? Being able to influence outcomes, being able to own your actions and get people to coalesce around what you want and ask for the help you need is vital. It doesn't go away in ninth grade. It doesn't somehow magically dissipate in high school or college or your first job. Or your first sale. I know a lot of companies that employ that reverse cold call methodology to their sales program, which is I'll wait for somebody to call me and then ask me for the business as opposed to actually calling other people. It doesn't work so well. As a matter of fact, it gets harder as we go through our careers. The more veteran we are, the harder asking becomes. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second. So maybe you can relate to that. 
this idea that this is a skill that's fundamental. The truth is this. You don't get what you don't ask for. If you don't believe that, if you haven't lived a life of experience where essentially the good things in your life are those things you've gone out and gotten by persuasion and influence and advocation, then perhaps this won't resonate with you. But for most people in our workshops, and we do these all over the globe, with teams big and small, most people say that's a fundamental truth. You don't get what you don't ask for. So let's talk a little bit about influence real quick. Purposes of today, it's pretty simple. There's three ways I want you to think about how you influence others. One way is very common. You do it so often, you forget you're doing it. It's almost like a crutch. It's almost you forget that you're leaning on it. And that, that type of influence is called information. You have a huge bucket of information right here that you source all the time to persuade people to say yes. Here's the information, here's our marketing kit, here's our pricing promotion, here's our new incentives. All designed so that you, the audience, will say, yes, I don't even have to ask you. Information is there. You'll connect the dots, you'll figure it out, and you'll say yes to me and I don't even have to expose my ego to the fact that you may say no. And that's what the challenge is with information. It's slow, it's resource intensive, and it's expensive. And by the way, your competition, they've got a lot of information too. And very few people these days wake up in the morning and say, by God, I'm short on information. I don't know how else to get it. So be careful with how much you think you influence the use of information. It's typically pretty weak when it comes down to it. But it's very risk-free. I got no ego in it. Here's the information, Sherlock, you'll solve it for me. Life will go on. And it's very slow. Now on the other end of the continuum is command. There are times in our life we get to tell people what to do and by God, we expect them to do it. Not just in traffic, by the way, but other areas of our um, culture, like if you're a parent, you don't inform your kids about the traffic in the front of the house. You tell them to go play in the backyard where it's safe. As mentors, as coaches, as bosses, there are times when we are expected to tell somebody what to do and they are expected to do it. That's good leadership. Clearly establishing expectations, clearly establishing what happens if those expectations aren't met, is a key to success and when you can command when you have the authority and the responsibility to tell somebody what to do don't ask them to do it because there's nothing quite as bad as asking somebody to do something you're really trying to tell them to do that's just dysfunctional that just doesn't get anything done and when they don't do it the feedback back to you is well you asked me to do this and I chose not to and they don't have that choice so be clear and Concise with your commands. When you can command, when you have the authority and responsibility to tell somebody to do something, don't ask them to do it. So we have this bucket over here called information, big, vast, slow. This bucket called command, which is purposeful and very effective, but we don't get to use it all that much. And in the middle sits this huge part of our life where information is too slow, we don't have the authority or responsibility to tell somebody what to do, so we have to persuade them. We have to influence them. Now bring that up because your choice of what bucket to use in terms of your influence will drive a lot of the outcomes you get in life. Do you rely on information only? Well, good luck with that. Are you used to telling people what to do? Don't know how to interact with them in any other way? Or like my ninth grader, in his geometry class, do you have to influence, but you never learned how? Well, I'm here to tell you how to do that. Now, when I ask people, why is it that you don't ask for what you want? I get a whole list of things. Why don't you ask for what you want? You know you have to. You don't get what you don't ask for. That's a fundamental part. So why don't we ask for what we want? And people all the time say, well, Fear rejection. Certainly don't want to hear the word no. Who does? Matter of fact, your brain is stimulated very similarly when you hear the word no to when you stub your toe. Not many of us wake up in the morning and go, hey, I can't wait to stub my toe 30 times today. But that's what salespeople do. 
I go out, I interact, and it's binary. I get a yes or a no, and when I get a no, that doesn't feel good. So rejection is a real true cause of our reluctance to ask. That's where we rely on information. You see, if I can just give you more, who else needs to see it? Let's get them some information. That's where we go through that whole gymnastics of trying to get somebody to say yes without asking them. Other reasons we don't ask for what we want is we, we don't know what it is, right? We just, we hope to figure it out when we're having this conversation. Some people don't want to be inappropriate. What's other words for that? Don't want to be too salesy, pushy, abrasive. Other words similar to those. They don't want to be inappropriate. They're not sure the right person is there to ask. They're not sure the timing is right. There's this whole reason, this whole list of reasons that we don't ask for what we want, even though we know we have to. And maybe the biggest reason of all is biology. We are built against asking. We are built against influence. Why? We don't want to ruffle any feathers. We want to fit in. We want to be part of the team. We want, don't want to be that outsider. It's interesting that your ancestors were equally afraid of getting kicked off the island as they were the saber tooth. Both had great risks. So we have learned over time in biology, in our heads, the reptilian part says, get in, don't ruffle feathers. Don't be that person that's excommunicated. So in the end, what we end up doing <coughs> is not asking even though we know we have to. And that's troubling. That's troubling because that makes you something we call a dumb ask. Yes, it's supposed to be funny. A dumb ask. And what does a dumb ask do? They don't ask for what they want. They lead with information. They tell people all the reasons without ever asking. And that's inefficient. As a matter of fact, that's something we call looping behavior. Looping behavior is where you cycle through information after information after information, constantly thinking you're making advancement when in fact you're just Spinning your wheels. It's one of the key challenges every single leader has. Why? Everybody's busy. Everybody's running around with their hair on fire. We need more technology. We need better pricing. We need better products. But are we actually gaining on influence? Or are we just cycling through more and more information? Remember, when you cycle through more information, it's because you're not clear on what it is you want. You haven't asked for it. And so you're in this vague part of influence, not sure what you want, they're not sure what you're asking for, and that vagueness creates delay and expense. So we know we have to ask for what we want. A good first step is to know what we want. As a matter of fact, the first step of the asking formula is know what you want. When? Every single time you have a meeting. Every single time you have a sales call. Every phone call. Anytime you want to influence an outcome, you better know what that outcome is or you're not going to get it. You're going to loop because your audience doesn't know what the solution is. They don't know what the question is. They don't know what you're asking them for. And they're more than willing to take up more time, energy, and resource. First thing then is know what you want. Think about a situation right now that you're engaged in, something you want to drive forward. Think of that actual person that you stand before right now. If you can't think of it, maybe something you've done in the past that hasn't been effective. Or you're procrastinating on. Something that you have to go and ask somebody for something in order for you to achieve your goal. And I want you to think about that individual situation and I want you to write down a want statement. I want you to write down an objective. What is it you want? Put it down on paper. If it's a phone call, great. If it's an email, fine. If it's a meeting, super. You've done something now that most salespeople won't do. Why? Because we're lazy. We're used to, if, you're, if you've been in sales for a while, you're a veteran. You're, we're used to winning. We're used to hitting our numbers. We'll get there. I don't have to put a lot of prep in. Are you kidding me? I'm your number one sales guy. Why are you busting my hump for? I'll close the deal. We'll go out. We'll two-step it. We'll shoot from the hip. We'll wing it. We'll free form it. And that's how you drift off your goal. You're not driving anything. Setting up an objective for each meeting is what you used to do when you cut your teeth in sales, right? You're new in sales, you come on board, who am I gonna talk to, what's their background, how do I link into them, what's the information I need to have in order to persuade them? Eh, four years in, you're like, eh, done this a thousand times. Pretty good at it, we'll figure it out. So be careful, not knowing what you want before asking for it 
means you don't get what you want. Not knowing what you want before asking for it means you don't get what you want. The first step of the asking formula is know what you want. Now, I want you to write that down, but do it in a couple of ways to drive discipline. First one is make it specific, especially you leaders out there, especially you guys with the big titles. Big title people like to ask for buy-in or alignment or more teamwork. Those are big words that don't mean anything in terms of change. People just hide behind them. They won't do anything. I've had people say, I want my sales leaders to act more like sales leaders. Okay. Nothing's going to change there. Be specific. Make it measurable. That's a key driver. Can I measure you? If I can't measure you, then I don't really know if you're being successful in gaining what you want. Make it achievable. Now, I'm going to spend some time here on the whiteboard. I'm a process guy. I was a chief operating officer, as I said. So everything for me is a process-driven discussion. And sales are no different, by the way. You know, when you're running operations, you know where all the inventory is. You know who's going to deliver it, when it's on the truck, what happens if there's quality control. That's things that we think about. But you know what? We, far too often in sales, we put up with, well, I don't know where that sale is at. I'm not sure we're going to close that yet. Don't know where that prospect is thinking. Might close it, might not. That's just unaccountability. We got to stop that. Everything is a process. Each step of the process leads to the next step of the process. It builds. When you're in an ops, you're looking at reducing handoffs. Why? Because that improves quality. You're looking to Kaizen it, six segment it, shorten it up, streamline it. Why? Because we want more throughput. So what's the process of a sale? What's the first step? I'm old school, right? So here it is. It's a cold call. First step. What happens after that? Well, we get an appointment. What happens in the appointment? Well, we might get a test drive. What happens after the test drive? What do you want? Well, a uh, purchase order. Purchase order and a sale. Boom, process of a sale. That, that exists for you. You might say, no, it doesn't. Every process, every sale is different. No, it's not. Every sale follows a similar process. This is called a sales progression, a cadence, whatever it may be. A couple pieces of learning here when you think about a want statement. Your goal is not to sell anything when you are cold calling. And as a matter of fact, if you think that's your goal, you'll never pick up the phone. Why? I can't. I, picking up the phone and making a cold call. I don't know if this guy's ready to have a close yet. Of course not. All you're doing is asking for the appointment. That's it. That's your reasonable, realistic, achievable goal. Now what happens at the appointment? I'm asking for the test drive. That's the reason of the appointment. That's what I want from the appointment. If I don't know what I want, I don't ask for it and I don't get it. But I know what I want. Now I know I have to ask for it. All the way down. You can do sale to referral or sale to service increase or sale to extension, whatever it may be. This process goes on. Now this seems kind of foolish to think, cool call a sale. But equally as foolish is not doing this step. This step right here is the most important action you can take as a sales professional. Each step of the sales progress, progression, each step of the sales cadence, by definition, ends with you asking for the next step. If you don't, you don't get it. You need to be prepared at the end of that cold call to ask for the appointment. This is where we fail. We think the process will flow without us. It doesn't. Just like Jack didn't get help in ninth grade geometry from his teacher because he didn't ask, you don't get the next step of the sales process. Stop thinking of yourself as a salesperson and start thinking of yourself as an operations manager who's constantly pushing the process forward with discipline and alacrity and clarity and courageousness and confidence. Why? Because I know how to ask for each step of this and get my audience to say yes. Ultimately, you achieve your goal. So make your want statement achievable. Make it time-bound. 
If you want referrals, great, I'll give you those to you next year. Or whenever I get around to it. Well, no, I wanted those referrals right now. That's not what you asked for. So put a time, if there's a time-bound nature of your ask, then put it in there. You've done something really great here. You're starting to push the process, not having the process push you. You're starting to own the process, not having the process own you. Why? Because you did a little step, you know what you wanted, and you wrote it down. Now I know what I want. It's specific, it's measurable, it's achievable, it's results-oriented. I don't want hard people to work harder. I want better results. It's time-bound. That is an acronym that says SMART. Many of you are used to that SMART goals. These are SMART objectives. Specific, measurable, achievable, results-oriented, and time-bound. I know what I want. Now you have to ask for it. You said and agreed 10 minutes ago that you don't get what you don't ask for. Now I know what I want. Ask for it. When? Directly, to the point. Get it out there. Get your audience focused on what the subject is. When you lead with information, you're leading with distractions, problems, non-solutions. They don't know where you're going. They distract you and they are distracted. You chase rabbits down holes. Why? No one owns it. So off the races we go. Ask for what you want and here's how you're going to do it. You're going to start your sentence with the following words. I am asking for... And then whatever you want, whatever you wrote down for your want statement, finish that sentence. I am asking for 15 minutes of your time next Tuesday. I'm asking for you to sign this purchase order and purchase this automobile. I'm asking for you to sign the service agreement and upgrade the service level that we can provide to you. I'm asking for three referrals of people that would benefit from the work we've done together. And I like those by the end of the meeting today. Think about it. It's a very powerful declarative statement. That statement ends with a period, not a comma, not a question mark. I own this, I know where we're going, I know what I'm asking for. It's commanding voice. Remember we talked about the command level of influence? It's taking those powerful way of influencing, telling somebody what to do, adopting that tone with confidence and authority. And yet the word ask is there. I wrote the book, The Asking Formula on Purpose. The word ask is a magic word. A synonym might be invite. I'm inviting you in. This is symbiotic. I'm asking you. We're joined in this conversation. But I'm taking a very deliberate tone to force a conclusion. It's hard for somebody to feel you're doing something to them when you ask them to do it. Remember a few minutes ago when I said that stops change when they feel you're doing something? Well, this is a technique to get them feel they're part of the process, part of the change, part of the agreement with you. I am asking for is a discipline you should put into place immediately. Not, I think, perhaps, maybe you want, cut all that extraneous stuff out and ask directly for what you want. Your audience will see you as a professional. Why do some people move forward and achieve more results than others? Because they're asking for more results. They're taking the time to do that on purpose. That's the power some of us have never learned. What happens after you ask for what you want? You have to provide three best reasons, three best reasons why your audience would want to say yes. Now we go through a lot of work around best reasons in our workshops. We really work hard to really understand what this means, but essentially what best reasons are, are what's in it for your audience to say yes. Be careful here. A lot of us think the information we pr provide is what's in it for our audience. That's marketing. That's what's in it for us. That's uninfluential. There's nothing here in this bucket, not one thing that's influential. If it was, we wouldn't need you, because all you have to do is go read it online. So you have to understand what's in it for your audience to say yes, and get very good at that, and not be delusional that my marketing, or my, my cool pricing, or my cool comparatives will win the day. It's what's in it for them. If the compar comparables mean nothing to them, it's not influential. And the only way to get to a best reason is by asking what's in it for them to say yes. That's it. 
A lot of us think if we talk enough, we'll understand what's in it for them. That's just, that's just nonsensical. We have to get good at listening and understanding the emotions behind it. Like I said, this takes a little bit of practice and work. And as a matter of fact, we have some really cool techniques to get this done. But the end game is to develop three best reasons. And a best reason is to describe what's in it for you to say yes to me. Why three best reasons? Why not eight? Why not 15? Why not one atom bomb best reason? Well, it's interesting because people... There's actually three reasons why you need three best reasons, which is very elegant, by the way. Reason number one, this is how we've learned to learn. ABCs, do, re, mi's, one, two, threes, hickory, dickory, dock, three, three blind mice, three musketeers, rub a dub dub, three men in a tub. Real estate's all about location, location, location. Not location, 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 location. That's just awkward. Or real estate's about location. No, it doesn't do it. We're not used to learning that way. Your audience has learned to learn in sets of three. Why disrupt that? You're trying to influence. Why work against that? The second reason you need three best reasons is because your audience is used to seeing a pattern develop. Two reasons is not enough to establish a logical pattern Four reasons or more is called looping. If you can't establish a pattern in three, here's a news flash. Four doesn't matter. Five is worse. Six is more confusing. Seven, please shut up. Eight, you should be tired and feathered. You can't just pile on more and more. People shut down. If you can't establish a logical progression in three, you don't have any influence. People want to see a pattern together, put together. Two is not enough. Four best reasons or more is looping. Three is the magical number. And finally, the third reason you use three best reasons. People are willing to wait for three. You'll be amazed how seldom they interrupt you. And if they do, it's very reasonable for you to say, let me address that in just a second. I want to get my three best reasons out. Now recently I went into a computer store, big brand, they had taken our courses and they had trained their people on it. Now, they, this individual I don't think recognized me. I went in for a new laptop. I travel a lot. I like Apple products. Um, kind of an Apple guy. I wanted it all integrated, good security, easy to use. I'm not a technologist. I just like simple, straightforward stuff. And when I went into this organization, went up to their computer department, the clerk, the service rep, approached me and instead of starting to sling hash, ask me who I was, ask me what I did. Why, why, was, why was I there today? Why now? What a great question to get to a best reason. Why now? What's the triggering event? How, what technology do you use at home? Who else has access to this? Why this? Why not that? How come you didn't go this path? Tell me a little bit about your career. What did you use back in your corporate days? Why didn't you like that? It was marvelous. And at the end, she looked at me and she said, Mr. Baker, I'm going to ask you to buy this brand of laptop. Now, there's a lot of reasons you've shared with me why this makes sense. But I found three really compelling reasons stood out. Can I share those with you? Are you kidding me? You thought I said something compelling? Absolutely share those with me. That's wonderful stuff. And then she proceeded to share what I had shared with her. She used my language to convince me to make that purchase. The magic language of the asking formula is your audience's language. That's what drives us to say yes, what we think, what we say, how we feel and believe. So be careful. Information is not that. Best reasons are what are influential. I know what I want. I'm asking directly for it, and I'm sharing with you three best reasons why you should say yes. And here's a clue for you leaders out there. If somebody on your team has three best reasons and they're not asking for what they want, they're procrastinating. It doesn't get better. Go get them, tiger. You have three great reasons. Knock them dead.
Now this is artful. This takes some work and some practice because most of us are so used to learning the information delivered to us and all we do is impart it to our clients, our prospects, and to each other. So we have to unlearn some behavior and relearn best reasons. You know what I want? I'm asking for it. I'm providing three best reasons. What do you do now? Stop talking. Nothing else happens here. If you add anything at this point of the formula, you detract from your influence. The best practice is simply repeat what you ask for. That's why I'm asking for 15 minutes of your time next Tuesday. It bookends your asks. You know when to start your ask, you know how to develop your ask, and now you know when to stop. But you know, most of us have this chronic problem. We don't know when to shut up. We don't know when to stop. And we sell through the closed. And we boggle and confuse our prospect. They thought they knew where we were going, but now here's this whole other slew of information. They don't know. Well, I'll get back to you. Let me think about it. I'll deliberate. Well, that's an interesting thing. Give me more information on it. And there you go, losing your influence. Have the courage to ask for what you want directly, pushing the process forward, sharing with them why they should say yes, and then repeating your ask and just letting them decide. That distinguishes you from everybody else that you're competing with. Why? Because they're going to throw information, they're going to throw detail, they're going to overwhelm their audience with more and more, and here you are getting decisions made. Where is all that great information, the detail, all that stuff that's produced? Yeah, you have it in your back pocket if somebody asks about it. You can bring it up and say, here, this is information that you asked about. But you don't lead with it. Clearly, you have to have some moxie and be able to say, if one of the things they're asking about is warranty, well, I should have some interesting information about why our warranty would be compelling for them. But if they don't talk about warranty, don't lead with it. It's not a best reason. What do you have to do now? Nothing, except put this to use. Go forth and apply this. I don't care if it's asking for a free dessert tonight at dinner. See if you get a free dessert from the server. Call the server over. I'm at, this meal was wonderful. Our compliments to the chef. I am asking for a free dessert. I'd like to share three reasons why you should say yes to that. And then give them three reasons. See what happens. If you don't use this technique, somebody will use it against you and push their yes forward. Nothing else you need to do but practice. And one of the things about asking is it's simple, on purpose. We wrote a book on this that's very short. We have workshops that are very straightforward and simple. And then people say, I got it, I'll go do it. But it's not easy, and that's the rub. If you don't practice this, if you don't apply this in front of each other on your team, as a leader, hold your, your staff accountable for it, they'll fall into bad habits. We insist on role playing. Why? Because people go, I got this, no problem. Well, stand up and ask me for what you want then, and let me give you some feedback on it. Whoa, that's scary. Of course it is. We don't want to stand out. We don't want to be inappropriate. We don't want to look foolish. We don't want to be ridiculed. Why didn't Jack ask his teacher for help in, eighth, in ninth grade geometry? He didn't want to look stupid. We still don't. So when you have to stand up and deliver this, a lot of emotion gets on, and that's what practice is for. You get good at it. It's a formula that you go through each and every time you want to drive an outcome. That's the asking formula. Go use it. Let me know how effective it's been for you. I love hearing success stories. I'm John Baker, the creator of the asking formula.